Hey there, guys. What is happening tonight? We are live here on the channel. And today, as you guys can see, I am kind of all by my lonesome. My cohort, Mr. Captain Ron, had to do some extra family work and everything tonight. So he is not going to be able to be joining us this evening. So you get to join with me. Uh, we might have another co-host on here tonight. He's uh, trying to get things kind of worked up on his computer and we're going to see how that one goes and hopefully we'll have uh, mr mcbake on here with us tonight as well we've got some pretty cool stuff in store to be able to show for you guys um so the first thing that i really wanted to talk to you guys uh, about tonight was about project vehicles i had a bunch of people asking as of lately, you know what's up with all the the projects and the vehicles and stuff because I guess we're going to have to say that what a lot of my channel has been grown the most on has been the, a lot of the tool stuff. And I get that one. But, you know, earlier on, the very first portion of my channel was started when I had my Duramax truck. Like it was started to document that truck and that build specifically is why I originally started it. Now, afterwards, I, you know, came to find out that a lot of people enjoyed the tools and the shop stuff, the shop foreman things, the, all of the automotive generalized um, options that I was able to bring to the channel. So that is what helped to grow the channel a lot. But at the same time, it was started in the fashion of me wanting to do project vehicles. So projects is where I'm getting at tonight. And a lot of the questions that I had was, you know, why are you going to be bringing on more project vehicles? We want to see more tools and more shop stuff. And I'm like, you know, I get that, guys. But you know what? This channel is still my channel. And my channel is how I want to run it is I want to have some projects. So for that uh, purpose alone, you know, we have the big can and project coming up that um, you guys kind of got introduced to. Uh, we're going to start seeing the very first few upgrades to that one come onto the channel this week. So you guys are going to get deep into that one. Kind of just waiting for warm weather to break before I can, you know, really go and rip around on it and show you guys a lot of the stuff that it is capable of doing. I've had a chance to put, you know, right around five hours or, or so of time into it. And that's one of those things where it's been a ton of fun to be able to do. Um, but, you know, just not great filming conditions for it. It's all been crappy and cold and dreary and wet, you know, Ohio crap here. So we've got that project coming up, and then I've got some other capabilities here soon to be able to bring you guys better content in the way of a few more project vehicles. Uh, I've got a, a good friend of mine who has a 2001 Viper that is pretty modded out, like fully built motor and everything that I'm wanting to bring you guys some footage for on this one. Sorry, Mr. Skinner, we don't have Captain Run ron running the uh back door of everything tonight so sorry on that one thumbs up to the projects i appreciate that one. Oh, we do have stream labs running still huh, must be running in the background on the computer how about that but anyways uh i wanted to bring somebody else on here tonight mr mcbake we're gonna bring him in here live how's it going buddy hi what's up man it's going good how's it going with you Real, real, real good. Uh, we kind of introduce everybody into the first point of the night, and that's going to be project vehicles. You okay. know, one of those things where you've got plenty of those going on. I uh, kind of wanted to bring up to the point of we have these project vehicles that we have a mindset of where we want them to go. Right. But how often do they either A, you know, get to where we want them, or B, you know, go way way past where we wanted them to go originally also so i know you've got a couple of project vehicles you want to uh tell the viewers about the ones that you have going on right now uh yeah a couple projects total ups and ends of the spectrum i mean so me and my father we had started a 1970 chevy nova um real sweet car it was it a is. legitimate barn find tires were all flat there were who knows how many critters living in it 
eight hundred dollars, and we towed that son of a gun home. Um, since then, I mean, that's all running, driving good, painted. But even when it looks done, it's never done. There's still another thing and another thing. And so now it's down to I have it in the garage, just detailing out the engine bay. I have a cabinet full of these things that I keep buying, whether it's engine block paint. I have some new valve cover gaskets, some new valve cover bolts, wire separators, all kinds of wire loom, different spark plug wires. And I have a cabinet full of all these things. And it's just about finding the time to do it. So, I mean, the project vehicles, it it's just shopping. You start shopping and you get parts and parts and parts and parts. And you're like, well, now I got to put all this crap on. Holy cow. So that's the real exciting one. Oh, I can't hear him. Can you guys hear Rust Belt? Can you hear me now? I do hear you. Okay, sorry. My, my thing was switched on here. Um, so with these project vehicles, uh, it's really hard to see where you're wanting to go. And especially in that beginning stages, you get the excitement of it. And you're just like, all right, me and Amazon, we're like this. And yeah. we're going to town. Shaka Gillis coming in. Just a quick reminder to tell us that Royobi is trash. Thank you for the donation, Shaka, and your insight into the matter. <laughs> so it, that initial point on these project vehicles, when you get them going, you have so many wants and you get to like click, click happy, yep. like nobody's business. For sure. I know I did when I've started this uh, Can-Am project, <laughs> you know, working with some of the sponsors and stuff that I'm going to be working with, uh, as well as some of the things that I myself wanted to put on it. I got a pile of parts already mm -hmm. coming up and I don't even have a third of what I'm going to be doing to it eventually. And it's going to be crazy. But I, the, again, like you said, is finding the time to do it. And then not only the time to do that, but the time to also document it because you know yeah. that once you get started in these things, you really want to get them done. Like I, I want to go out there. I want to throw on 15 of these parts, but at the same time, I know that I need to film them and I also know that it takes me five times as long to put these things on when I have to film them. That's the hardest thing is now that I have this YouTube channel, which has been neglected the past few weeks. I'm getting back on that. Life's been crazy. I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. But yeah, it's about going out there and actually filming these projects because people do want to see it. It doesn't do as many views as tools, of course, but people do want to see it. I mean, just what, two weeks ago? I put a new transmission in my Lancer and I had it pulled out and it's like, Oh, I'm done for the day. And then you looked at me and he's like, did you film any? I was like, no, I didn't. Oops. I probably <laughs> should have pulled me from that tranny. <laughs> but yeah, you get motivated and you're like, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to jump in and do it. You don't even think I don't even want to take the time to set up these lights and then set up the tripod, the camera record, find the SD card, do all that. You just do it sometimes. And so the other project that I have, it's more of a flip than a project. The Nova will be here forever. My 08 Mitsubishi Lancer GTS. I saved it from certain death. I mean, this dude rode it hard and put it away wet. And so, I mean, it's new tranny, two new axles, new seals everywhere. It, so much love has gone into it. And it's getting to the point where it's, it's about done. I'm going to send it on its merry way. Sending and, it on its merry way. Yep. Now, I gotta, are, are you able it. to tell what your new project's going to be? Um, I mean, I've been looking around for a long time, and we're ready to pull the trigger. As soon as I find the right one, which I have a couple prospects, uh, that would be a 2010 or 11 WRX. Going from the yeah, Lancer yeah. to the big boy WRX Turbo. That's what we're talking about. Liter. Some of that super subs. It's, I've been showing you all of these links, and I have a really good deal on that WRX I sent you that video of. Mm -hmm. The dude from last night that was the STI that was decked out with like a custom blow-off valve and just tuned to the hills, he actually came back and he said, you know what, I'll do the 10 grand plus your Lancer. And so now it's like, oh man, I might just, <laughs> I might just drop my Lancer down to Cincinnati and give the guy 10 grand. And get this STI. <laughs> Dude, that STI ah. that he showed me, it looked legit. It, it was, was too, pretty. 
It was pretty freaking nice. I would have to say so myself. And I'm pretty jealous of that one because I used to own one of those. One of my earlier cars that I owned was a 2012 uh, WRX. And it was a 2.5 turbo pearl white hatch. I know that's not going to look right. Oh, that engine bay is pretty clean looking too. I know from the yeah. parts list that you showed me, that was that was a pretty he's, legit he's build. He sent to me it. A, a mod list: manly H beam connecting rods, forged piston and rings, ACL crank bearings, and then just going through ring gap check, this check, that check, the Gates Racing timing belt kit, AEM cold air, full turbo back exhaust, a stage one organic clutch kit, which will be nice, Apex turbo timer. It was, it's, that one's done up big. See, and I, I love those. And I, the whole point of projects is what you are feeling in and of that moment. Mm -hmm. And I know you and I know, like me, especially I get something, we get something shiny and yeah. it's, you know, something's going to change really quick. So when we actually make and take the time to commit, actually commit to a project and that's the point where you're like, wow, this is really going to happen. And this is going to be freaking mm -hmm. amazing. <laughs> yeah. And then it's just that rush of looking at all the parts. What can you do to it? When you got the Can-Am, as soon as you told me and you sent me a picture, I was shopping for parts for you. That's, that's, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, look at this windshield. Look at this windshield wiper kit you can get. This is such cool stuff. Uh-huh. And the cool thing about that one is the fact that that it's uh you know both on road and off road i can take it pretty yeah. much wherever i want and i'm able to license it so you know this summer i'm just gonna drive it li oh, literally right. everywhere oh 100 i'm gonna be driving this 200 horse can am through the middle of you know our whatever classic town and <laughs> making everybody's ears shatter after i get the exhaust changed on it <laughs> and this is kind of on the topic of project vehicles that i just thought of sundays jrc 54 normally uploads and that civic build he's doing right now i'm super into oh he yeah is. that one was pretty oh, nice my build. God. he's turned that into one hell of a build yeah man that civic it's insane so yeah if you guys haven't checked out jrc 54 he's doing a civic build right now that is just putting in all the monies <laughs> doing everything <laughs> but when he said like the video that he just dropped when you're gonna do it you might as well do it right yeah you know because then you know a year down the road that's where you get to the point where especially in the big parts of the project you get into motor work and stuff like mm -hmm. that you don't want to have that feeling down the road you're like wow i wish i would have done this or i wish i would have put those better connecting rods in. i wish i would have waited two more weeks and spent more money on this part which kind of shows like it's different mentality for the two different kind of projects there's that i love this car I will have this forever for the foreseeable future. So you do everything. Once when you tear it apart, you're like, well, I might as well just replace the bolts with new looking bolts. And then there's the mm -hmm. flips, like my Lancer, where it's shit. It works good. Ship it, man. It doesn't have to look good. <laughs> so yeah, you, you can tell he's putting all the love into that Civic. And that's why I'm so into it right now. Yeah, I mean, just seeing somebody's passion. Like, me personally, I'm not into civics. Like, I just never have been. It wasn't one of those phases for me. Right. You know, you say the same yeah. thing about my diesel. He likes them diesel. Them nice them, rigs. That's nice rigs. <laughs> I, we're definitely on the opposite end of the spectrum where, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm into tuners and you know it. But the fact that we can, the fact that we can respect, yeah. that we can respect each other's builds and the 100%. processes of which we do it because of the passion that we want to be mm -hmm. able to put into it, and that's why I love seeing these channels that have all of these projects and these different builds. I wish, I really wish that I, you know, had the funds or the the size of a channel like you know street speed 717 where you're able to get a new project vehicle in every you know oh, man, three yeah. four weeks dump a buttload of cash in do all the upgrades to it for like a month and then you know what i got some shiny syndrome i want something else even That'd if it's nice. like putting an exoskeleton on an old blazer and making it a beast <laughs> off-road vehicle that would be you sick. know those kind of builds are freaking awesome. I love seeing those crazy things. 
I would love to find an old TJ Jeep build. If I could find a TJ for the right price, that's one of those ones that I would put my heart and soul into and just keep for myself. I'd love to have a just a mud and Jeep. You'll have one of them eventually. Oh, yeah, I will. I know those sure. the projects that I I have a list of them. It, I I keep lists for a lot of things. My phone is like my list central. Do you? you know, of oh yeah. I mean, with all of everything that I have going on between businesses and work and YouTube, how do I you know keep up with certain things? You know, right. I've got I've got a list probably fifty lines long of video ideas that i want to be able to do and get out on my channel but i just don't have time right. don't have you know the will for certain things and it's it's hard finding that time and that will to jump oh, yeah. on everything but i like having it written down there nice tucked away for me <laughs> i respect it maybe i should have a list keep my head on a little straight uh huh. now with with some of those project vehicles at what point do you consider them gone too far? Because even like daily drivers, I mm -hmm. still consider those project vehicles in right, some way, shape, or form. Oh, yeah. It, everything is going to get modded. That's not a project. <laughs> the only ones if, I will not touch are my wife's car. If it's I, under I warranty, not I'm not going to touch it. Mm -hmm. She keeps the nice, warrantied, good car. My cars are projects. I'm going to mess yeah. with them. You exactly. can't help Brian, mess with them. Brian said about Goon Squad on here, they do some pretty crazy builds. Oh, I've never seen Goon Squad. Yeah, they're pretty good. I think for builds, my favorite YouTube channel is probably Watch JR Go, if you guys have ever seen him. He does a lot of flips. Like He'll just find busted beamers. And he'll Was he the one that up. put the LS swap? The Yeah, uh, right now he's LS swapping a Rolls Royce. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's one of his more insane yeah, builds. But watch the Argo. That's a good YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And we're talking about YouTube, so I'm scatterbrained like this. This is why I need lists. Did you get that <laughs> thing I sent you on Instagram that Doug DeMiro is doing a 96 SS? I have not seen that yet. <laughs> he, he hasn't posted on YouTube yet, but he's going to do one of his reviews on uh, Impala SS. Which I know right away SS. we kind of uh, <sighs> bonded over that Impala SS. Yep, that, that brings back memories. My dad had that 96 Impala oh, SS. Man. That will be one of the projects that I will do eventually. Yeah. It will be one of those. So, yeah. I always wanted one. It's a dream car. For sure. But then again, I have a lot of dream cars. <laughs> mm. I have a new one tomorrow, I'm sure. No, <laughs> Funny enough, Walter Frederick says his dad is good friends with who sells travel and enclosed trailers. Um, so speaking of trailers, oh, Fiero with the Nelt C1, that's awesome. Yeah, speaking of, I fun tried trailers. selling Rust Belt. I found a Fiero for him, and I was like, "This needs no, to be the Rust Belt mobile. Build no, this Fiero." No, <laughs> dude, you fitting look so in good one of those. Fiero. If you, you don't fit in them, like hey, you hardly sure you fit can. in one. <laughs> sure You're you like can. half my size, and you barely fit in it. I'll tell you what, man. DIY Target Top, you'll fit just fine. It'll be good. <laughs> DIY target top. That doesn't spell disaster <laughs> just as it is. No, it's a Fiero. There's no structural yeah. support there anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I know we, we get all enthralled into these project builds and I fell into one of those black holes this last week and this weekend. I, uh, I purchased a trailer for the build for the can-am because you know i can't take it everywhere i need to yet it's not street legal yet so i need to get a trailer to be able to take it to places that i want to be able to take it so i get online and i'm looking and i look at the specs of the vehicle and i look at the size trailers and i'm like you know what one of these ones this seven foot by 14 foot this will be perfect it'll just fit in i don't need much more and cool so I find a hell of a good deal on it. It's a nice trailer. And I, I get it home and I get the thing weighed and I go and get the tags for it. And I finally take the time to get all the vehicles moved out because the Can-Am is in my garage and everything else is all in the way. So we get everything moved out and I go to back it out and then go to try to put it on the trailer. And when I say it just fits, it just 
fit. Like both tires are squeaking the weather stripping <laughs> on both sides of it as I put it into the trailer. And then I go to put it in there. I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's in there. And I like, I tap the front cabinets with the, the push bar on there. Really? And oh yeah. And then I have to climb out Dukes of Hazard style. Cause I can't get the door open Dukes of Hazard up over the front wheel, climb across the front cabinets. Cause it's a V nose and then out the side door. And I look and I've got like an inch and a half behind it. It is just in there. I knew it was going to be tight. I didn't know it was going to be that tight. But I knew it was going to be tight. I, I didn't realize it was going to be that crazy and tight either, but it was, and I'm kicking myself in the butt now at this point, but at least I left. There was some meat left on the bone, which I bought it for. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to turn it around, flip it and get rid of that trailer. So now I'm going to have to find me another one. There you go. That trailer just went from project type a to project type b mm. now it's a flip <laughs> now it's getting her gone <laughs> and there's not a whole lot that that one is going to need i figured out no. the a little electrical issue was oh good yep so we figured everything out put a new handle on the side of it that has a key uh all that kind of new new stuff to it so it'll be a good good little trailer for somebody i got a couple of bites on it already so we'll see how quick we can get that one gone before it'll even make its way onto the channel probably so i don't know if you have like a outline made for this episode but can i interject a conversation here let's do it i love project cars obviously if you could have any project money is no option what is your dream project any project any project they'll find a way well well, Again, mine changes daily. <laughs> uh, my, it, that is really hard to say because mm -hmm. there's different things between projects and there's cars that I want. So yeah. I, everybody always had those that dream car that you want. The dream car that I wanted was the uh, Jaguar XJ220. But would you do anything to a 220? That's not really a project. I don't, think you, I don't yeah. think you could. It would be one of those sacrilegious things where it's right. it's almost impossible to. Right. That's that's what I'm saying. Like the dream cars are great. A Porsche GT2, not a GT3. I'd love to have one, but I wouldn't touch that thing. So like That's true. A dream project for me would obviously be a full-on Rusto Mod 67 Chevelle. Like I'm talking I want to take like a complete chassis of a new Camaro and basically fit a 67 Chevelle body on it as a daily driver. I mean, that would be a massive project. That would but be pretty sweet. Imagine just having all the luxuries out there, turnkey, just basically a 2020 Camaro, but the entire body and everything is the 67 Chevelle. Oh, it'd be so good. That's the dream project. I will never have that much money. I could never do it. But you give me yeah. an infinite budget yeah. and like I six I and don't like a year that, off that work. I don't think that one would be as hard as you would think it would be. Now the no. body, the body stuff of it, yes, right. But You're the electrical reshaping stuff, and lengthening, yeah. and the body would take a long time. The electrical the body stuff, yeah. portion of it, that's where I would, you know, hit a brick wall on there. But as far as the electrical and figuring all that stuff out, oh, right. that'd, that'd be, be hard. Fun. That'd be cake. Yeah, That'd be cake you just, on that I'm, I'm talking, I just want a new Camaro. I want to rip all the body off and then just start fitting a 67 Chevelle body. That's mm -hmm. that's the dream project. That would be a long process. It would cost a lot of money. But Speaking that's the dream. of, Mr. Captain Ron is making an appearance from his work schedule in tonight. I already <laughs> did that. I already did that project, Master, yep. uh, Captain Ron. That project's done. Check year. Off the list. <laughs> <laughs> I think my biggest project that I would want to do, I have I have two of them, pretty big size ones that I'd love to do. One is I want to build a project kit car for a okay. track a track day car. That so I want to build project. one. I want to find one that has tube chassis mm -hmm. to be able to put an all wheel drive Subaru drivetrain in. Okay. So it would be, you know, 
all wheel symmetrical, all wheel drive, uh, you know, turbocharged, mm-hmm. lighter than anything, you right, know, full on get, fiberglass. Oh yeah. Get into carbon fiber work. Cause I'd, I'd love to start chassis. trying to work with carbon fiber. I think that would be something cool to learn too. Yeah. I wonder I how, think, how do you work with carbon fiber? Is it kind of like fiberglass you think? Yes. Okay. I've done some fiberglass work, but I'm not carbon fiber. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But yeah, being able to have one of those stripped down to nothing, mm-hmm. kick car, tube chassis with, you know, whatever you want to throw into it that I can make all wheel drive 400 horsepower, that it's just a donut track eating yeah. machine. That's what I would love to do. That would, would be also gnarly. love to do a modern challenger, like a 15 or so challenger. And I want to make, I want to make it a full on track car because people say that those are big, heavy, some bitches that they can't do anything but go in a straight line. And yeah. I want to make one all wheel drive and I want to make it an actual track car that is worthy of being all, an American car on the track. So you'd have to come up with a badass nickname then. If it's a oh, challenger, yeah. like the oh, demon yeah. slayer, the demon <laughs> slayer. <laughs> now we're getting into like Disney terms. Come on. I mean, think about Hellcat, demon, red yeah. eye, like hellhound. That's the hellhound. hellhound. There we go. That'd be all right. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be bad. I can yeah, get down with that. That wouldn't be bad at all. Oh. No, that's what I would love to do big supercharged have all the power that they normally have but Mm -hmm. be able to have an adjustable chassis to it something that sits mean sits low maybe even shorten it up a bit taking you know the body in bringing those lines in further uh cutting some of the nose nose off of it yeah that's where all those crazy body things would get into yeah in the way but i would really want to make it like well well done to make it an actual right you have infinite money you can go rent out a wind tunnel get some specialists in there yeah exactly when it's infinite money then i would want to make an insane track ready all-wheel drive challenger that's sick that's much better than my answer i'm talking about getting a boring ass daily driver you're like nah (laughs) i'm gonna track beast (laughs) (laughs) yep i I really do i want to be able to eat up just about any track that i throw it at i earlier on so a couple of years ago i was really into the imsa racing uh the that in the american uh concourse runners yeah, yeah So here in Ohio, there's a track called mid Ohio raceway and they had some of those races actually there. And back in 2012, I think it was Dodge reintroduced the Viper back into the IMSA courses. So see it. I got to see the Viper on its debut back in 2012. And I got to talk with uh, Ralph Gillies, who's the head SRT designer for Dodge. I got to talk with him at the track on the day they debuted again. So that was, that was some awesome to see these. That's pretty sick. Freaking track jetted up vipers and they ate up the track that day it just it bums me out that they canceled that program so soon though they just they need to bring back the viper i don't understand why they haven't (laughs) with the c8 vet and the new 4 gt mopar needs a supercar Mm mm-hmm uh, yeah, they. I, I really wish they would be able to get back into that. Now they got. They've got the going fast down. <laughs> they, oh mean, yeah, the oh, demon. Yeah. They've got that one down, packed, ready to roll. Now whether they can put it back into a trackable package, something that's going to keep up with, you know, other supercars. Right. Yeah, that's that one's yet to be seen. But I do like the fact that they have kept true to their, you know, roots and made everything still yeah. semi affordable. They yeah. haven't gone into the outrageous range yet. Viper with the hell of it. Mm-hmm. They thought Gen One Viper was too dangerous. <laughs> oh, those are absolutely nuts. And I was talking earlier. Um, one of the guys who does our supplying for the dealership for our uh, detail stuff, he's got a two thousand viper really uh-huh built motor 
like nitrous, the whole mm -hmm. nine yards. And I really want to be able to bring it in uh, here, maybe even in the next month or two. Uh, I'm going to be bringing it into the dealership and doing a dewinterizing of it to make it kind of really? drivable for cars and coffee events and stuff for yeah. them. Do an oil change and go through it. I I think that would be a really sweet vehicle to be able to that kind of premiere cool. on the channel. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't know... Like I said earlier on, a lot of the things that I was catching flack for a bunch lately was not doing nearly as much tool things as I yeah. had been doing very often. But then again, like I said, this is my channel and this is kind of what I started it on the basis of wanting to do these project vehicles. And that's kind of where I'm focusing a lot of stuff too. I know I'm not getting as popular of views as I have to that one, but I still am going to throw some tool fun tool stuff in here and there, right. but I want to mix it in with the project vehicle. So right. as we do you these can't, builds, you can't bring yourself out. Them. You got to do what you want to do every now and then. I mean, what good is a tool if you're not doing anything with it? Mm -hmm. so, so that's mean, why I'm really loving this can am build because for the guys who don't know we're building it in conjunction with sp tools so on every single one of the upfits and stuff for the videos on this can am we're going to be showing a couple one or two of these tools to be able to see how you know how well they work uh, just kind of give them a debut and stuff like that um you know just to get people's tool fix in with it and i think that'll be a a really good way of getting some of these newer tool things into the mix too yeah see so i mean there's still tools in there yep i didn't have that many tools though in the the seat covering video i had one or yeah. two tools in there but not a whole lot in that one that was a hard video to to actually video when you're talking about you know having the projects and it takes four times as long to do when you have to film it right that was the video it took me three and a half, almost four hours to do one, one seat. seat cover. One. Oh, that's crazy. Like I'm used to doing these things flat rate time where I just take it out and start <laughs> ripping stuff apart, pulling it, pulling this, clip, clip, clip. This doesn't need to come apart that easily. Just rip it off. That's, that's the stuff I'm used to doing. Now I'm having to take my time, taking it apart, you know, mm -hmm. show every step along the way. Hey guys, you know, quick pro tip, make sure you don't do it this way because you might mess something up. Uh, yeah. When that took me like four hours to do a seat cover, that was one of the most miserable videos to shoot. I think I've ever shot. <laughs> Frustrating, huh? It really, really was. I, I love the stuff that I was doing to it. The seat shop, Boy, they knocked it out of the park with those covers. They are absolutely amazing. But I still haven't seen it in person. Uh, well, you'll have to see it tomorrow. It's yeah, funny. On Saturday when we were at the shop, I drove your truck and I didn't even pay attention. You didn't pay attention I to that one. I didn't pay attention. I should have looked. It was you cold. were too busy because you were cold and you couldn't uh -huh. reach the pedals. It's true. I couldn't. I got his truck out. <laughs> ah! So your I butt wasn't even so sitting on the base pad. <laughs> It's true. I was. <laughs> oh, well, that's a good one. We all know all right. Well, size. let's. Yeah, it happens. There's a lot of people like that, but we won't hold it against you. <laughs> let's uh, kind of roll into a new uh, little speaking portion here. Uh, I wanted to talk about upgrading tools. Uh, to bring some of the tool aspect back into the limelight for some of these guys. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. One of the biggest things right now that a lot of these tool companies push is the newest, latest, greatest, newer design, better handles, bigger uh, horsepower on it, better colors. You know, the the options go to the moon on what they're able to be able to give you and show you. Um, but at what point is it not beneficial for you anymore to be upgrading your tools over and over again? I know electric tools, especially they're going to be, you know, revolutionary to themselves in the market every couple of years, you get this snap on screw good on. And when they came out with these 7.2 volt um, lines of those, everyone's like, wow, that thing's the coolest 
it was like the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, it was that way for like a year and a half. And then they came out with the 14.4 uh, volt stuff. And then that was better. And then the upgraded 14.4. And then the new colors, and now you've got the two and a half amp hour 14.4 with a better clutches. You know, at what point do you say enough is enough when upgrading certain tools? I mean, with the electric tools, you just upgrade when they go out. I'm cheap. <laughs> I'm I'm a cheap guy, and so I see no reason to upgrade until it goes out, or if it's something that you just have to have. I guess I don't know. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I personally, I've got issues with tools. Like I really do. <laughs> we all there's that. Something new and shiny. I've been a lot better about that lately because I've got something shiny with vehicles and projects. Right. So I'm not spending nearly as much on tools as I was. But there have been a couple of good deals out on these newer upgrades to the tools. That's what gets you when the deals come around. Mm hmm. Yeah, James says, cough, cough, $20,000 toolboxes. <laughs> 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 yep. And I, and I get that one. Joel uh, said, don't upgrade till the tool breaks. Yeah, that's the boat I'm in. Get mm -hmm. what you need to get the job done. When your cheapy one breaks, then time for an upgrade. Now, one of the other things that I kind of wanted to relay that one into was when you are buying tools for a first time, and this is where McBake will you know, have quite a bit of expertise on this one, is when you buy these tools brand new, uh, obviously you don't need to be going and spending all of your money on getting, you know, all the snap-ons and Mac tools or whatever it is, you know, screwdriver sets, for instance. You don't have to go out and spend a mass load of money on, 170 200 and some dollar set of screwdrivers to be able to start things out when you're just an oil change or a lube tech right so at that point when is it okay to start upgrading those things because like you found out with certain ratchets from certain companies when they start breaking and obviously they do have lifetime warranties still right but when is it beneficial to upgrade those things when it's a Pain in the butt to go to the store. I mean, it's just like, so when I first went in there, you know, I bought three um, of the Pittsburgh ratchets, quarter inch, half inch, and the three eighths. And within probably, I'm not even kidding, the first week, my three eighths broke. Like within the first few days. And it was just so frustrating. So I had to run to Arbor Freight, swap that out. Tool truck comes around. And it's like, you know what? Last week I was, pssst, and I need a good quality ratchet. And so it's just, again, comes back to when they break. That's, that's when I've upgraded almost all my tools other than really good deals. It's when they break. I had my cheapy screwdrivers like three of the flatheads had broken because of those flathead screws that are all over the car. Not as a pry bar, those flathead screws. Mm -hmm. Three of those broke. So I was like, all right, I'm getting Mako screwdrivers because I keep breaking these. And so, oh, yeah. and then of course the deals. I mean, when the <laughs> truck comes around and it's a good deal, I can't say no to a good deal. Yeah, it is hard to be able to say no to something that's just a fantastic deal. And, when when you're first starting out, I had always told guys, hey, buy your first one cheap. They all have a lifetime warranty. Anymore, lifetime warranty doesn't mean hardly diddly squat. Right. You know, every everybody's got a lifetime warranty with just about anything. So lifetime warranty does not mean better tool. That just means they have good backers behind their, you know, cash flow to be able to replace them when they actually get broken. So uh, the, that part of the lifetime warranty doesn't really mean anything. It's how easy it is to get warrantied. One would be that. And then mm -hmm. how many times you have to warranty it. I personally think that once you get to the point where that tool is either breaking once, twice, and then you're having to go back two or three times to be able to have it warrantied out, and yeah. you feel that it shouldn't be that hard, or you see technicians with different kinds of them or better ones that 
if those better ones aren't breaking like that, maybe at that second time that you're warrantying them out, that's the time that you really should get into upgrades on those mounts. Um, earlier on, somebody asked about uh, Mr. GM Tech said something about the uh, uh, the thermal imager from Snap-on. Now, I personally have that one. We've messed around that one in the shop. And one of the biggest things that I said from going from the first generation of thermal imager to the second generation, I don't think that one's worth the upgrade at all when we're talking about that one. And that I really don't think it is, especially when you can get the first gen one. You can usually get them for about 600 bucks or so now. And then the second gen ones, buying them new, you're at $1,600. For a tool. Now I get it. Something shiny and everything. This one has a couple little more features. The screen's just a little bit larger. Refresh rate's a little bit better. But really, is it worth it? I don't think so in that one. I do like the thermal imager. Now, I don't use it as much as I really wish I would use it. Um, but it all depends on the circumstances in which you are working on vehicles within your shop. If you're doing a lot of diagnostic work, then yeah, it might be one of those things to be able to invest in and it would work out great. I've been able to uh, use it for coolant blockages, like somebody said earlier, all the way up until finding failed relays. Uh, certain circuits that have too much amperage and resistance, you can see where the heat builds up in that one. Uh, all the way down to obviously brakes. You can see what is uh, locked up in what area, the brakes that are locked up. It's, it's really cool to see it that one. I used it on a, an idler pulley on a Hemi a couple of weeks ago to find out which one of these pulleys was the one that was growling and the bearing was going out. So that was cool to see. But then, yeah, you can see all of that stuff with the normal one. So is it worth the upgrade? Not so much. Yep. But shiny tools. But shiny yeah. tools. <laughs> yep. That's right. That's what it comes down to. I Just mean, an I, ATV I coming in the house. What's up, buddy? He says, is it worth to quit your job to go work for your snap-on rep? Uh, Mr. Justin ATV would probably tell you no if you watch his channel. <laughs> Don't buy a tool truck. I mean, I think they have their their time and their place. And sometimes you can't help it. It's just so convenient. Mm -hmm. Like, there's so many times where I walk on the tool truck and I find something. And, you know, like most of us, then I get on Amazon. I start price matching. And it's like, oh, I could save $10. Or I could just buy it right now, if you know what I mean. And you buy it. Who cares? And when it's on the truck account. I have a personal philosophy when it comes to that one. Uh, I will look and see what it is on Amazon, you know, obviously for pricing purposes, especially when I make videos. Everybody wants to know the best price possible where you mm -hmm. can find these things at. Well, me personally, if it comes to within 10%, 8 to 10% of what that tool costs, and it, you know, 8 to 10% more on a tool truck. I will definitely go ahead and get it on the tool truck because I like supporting the local mm -hmm. business and especially the guy who comes to me whenever I call him or whenever I text him, no matter what, usually that is, is worth all that amount 10 times over to me. I think that's, that's definitely what the tool trucks are really good for. That's true. And you do want to support your truck guys for the longest time. I would want to buy everything on Maco just because right away. I mean, I just like our Maco guy. Yes, I do too. And it's, it's nice to be able to have, you know, especially when we have something broken that mm -hmm. we know there are some circumstances in which I know that if I broke this tool, it was kind of a specialty tool or a specialty buy item that if I called him or messaged him early enough and just asked him, Hey, this tool's broken he would be able to get it and have it for the day in which you know he came to the shop yeah but if i didn't or if it was a tool truck rep that i you know you didn't have in such well standing then you would be referred to the point of taking my broken tool onto the truck hey this is broke oh i don't have it in stock i have to order it and then it's going to be another week to week and a half before it comes in so you won't see that new tool for another two weeks 
So at what point do you prefer to buy cheap online? At what point would you run to Home Depot to buy something instead of the tool truck? Like, can you get away with buying cheap tools? And when it's so Milwaukee. what tools? Okay. <laughs> now I that one, that one doesn't, I know what you're asking and that one doesn't yeah, fit that bill. It doesn't fit that bill. Um, when I'm making custom tools, Okay. That's when I will either get one delivered from AutoZone or I go to Home Depot and get that one. Or those once every in a blue moon weird size sockets. Mm -hmm. Like um, a couple of weeks ago, we had to get a socket brought in to us from um, one of the parts stores because it was just some weird oddball size. Like inch and three sixteenths or inch and five sixteenths or something like that. I'm just like, yeah, nobody has that size socket and I'm not going to call Kevin and have them order this one freaking weird socket and right. pay $40 for it to use one time in the next year and a half. Okay. So there's for the guys out there, there's no hand tools that you can recommend by saying, just go get the cheap one. Just run to Harbor Freight, pick yourself up something. Now, now I can't say that one for sure because I still do have a set of Harbor Freight pliers in my toolbox. So would you so recommend those? I I would, and I have in my videos before. Those hose, all right. those curved nose hose Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pliers. I use them all the time. I know yeah. what you're talking about. Yep, I bought those at Harbor Freight for nine dollars like 10 years ago and so would you so would you get other pliers from harbor freight um or did you get the snap-on ones just because they were shiny no so it it depends on how much i use them that's one of those Mm -hmm. pairs of pliers that are they they're more of a special to use and i don't use them very often at all now the pliers that i use like pliers or use them once twice a day or every other day i i like having a better pair of pliers you know there's just a difference in the way you use them how they feel and that's where some of my snootiness on the tools comes out but it just depends on put the quote on the box snap Uh on pliers it's just how they feel yep it's the (laughs) way they feel but it depends on how often I'm using some of these things. Mm-hmm. A wire brush. <clears throat> Am I ever going to own a snap-on wire brush? Fuck no. Why not? <laughs> I'm never, ever going to own a snap-on wire brush <laughs> because I don't use it enough. Uh, it, when I do, I beat the crap out of it, and yeah. they just destroy them, and wire brushes are like $1. fifty at Harbor Freight. So. Why would I buy a $25 wire brush? So I don't think I've ever asked you this before. Out of your entire toolbox, are those hose pliers the only Harbor Freight tools you have? Uh, No. You you are very anti-Harbor Freight. I am. I should be more than what I am. I I would say that 30% of the tools I've bought from them have failed on me in a very short span of time. But there were certain points of my career early on when I was short on money and I yeah. was short on funds and I and I couldn't afford to buy all this stuff on the tool truck or I did have some debt, but I didn't want to build you know that debt up any more bigger than it already was. So I got some Harbor Freight stuff. Uh, there is I, now that I think about it, one other thing that is in my toolbox from Harbor Freight, and that is the um, the pair of plastic rivet tool yeah, the one that that Real little quick. hand tool that shout puts out the to harbor words. freight <laughs> <laughs> shout out mm-hmm. okay plastic rivet hand tool i got yeah you. that plastic rivet hand tool yep. because i had a project in which i needed the plastic rivets and i went there and they had the hand tool with a whole bunch of the plastic rivets already in a kit ready to go and so like four bucks yeah it was like four or five bucks <laughs> uh, yeah And it was one of those things where I don't use it very often. I use that hand tool like it's when I have to drill out plastic rivets for pulling inner fenders out sometimes. Right. So I'll use that one once every month or so. I actually just used it the other day on that Cherokee that McBake put back in that Cherokee 
the engine in that one that you mm-hmm. forgot to put the fender liner outside covering on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> gotcha. So I had to put that one back on. Okay. And yeah. that was the one time in the last month I've used it. I think I actually used it for mud flaps. No. Maybe not. Probably. I think I tried, but it wouldn't fit. So I don't know what I ended up doing. I may have used it. <laughs> yeah, I just there's some of those things where I just I've had Harbor Freight bite me in the ass so many times with yeah. crap tools that never lasted. Out of those two tools that are still in my toolbox from Harbor Freight, I used to go to Harbor Freight all the time. Uh-huh. Now I started getting turned off by it a lot when our it's not Harbor Freight's fault, but it's our local Harbor Freight's fault. We're having shitty employees and no one ever knows what they're talking about or where I mean, anything is yeah. inside the store. So that was one thing of why I don't like going there because I can't stand to have to talk to a brick wall and then just say, oh, I'm going to have to look it up. Well, that's, I guess that's another difference between you and I because I don't want to talk to employees. I will walk around in circles trying to find what I want before I ask somebody. But th- Oh, no. I will I wanna, say that I their stores be are store. never organized the way I feel like they should. You can never find exactly what you're looking for. But oh, I, no, I, I am definitely that way. I, when I go to a store, I mm-hmm. want to be helped and assisted in those stores and make me feel like my whole experience with the store is worth what I am paying them for. You know, what some you of those. Harbor Freight. <laughs> I pay I know money. How they can pay their employees with how cheap their tools are. That's well, crazy. I've seen the way right. some of those toys, those tools come into the country. Yeah, yeah. they they are not paying very much for them at all. <laughs> it is not tool related, but I'd like to know how many people. Do you want help, or do you want the employees to just leave you alone? Because I feel like the majority would just want them to leave them alone. Maybe that's just me. I don't want to hear your nonsense. I want to come in, find what I want, and get out. <laughs> that's no, what I, I, want. I, I want somebody to know where this stuff is because I don't like... I'm I'm usually also on a time crunch. Like I very, very rarely ever have the amount of time to be able to go into a store and just be like, yeah, I'm just here just kind of looking around. I got an extra 45 minutes. No. Yeah. That is never ever what I have time for. So I saw this is going on another tangent, but I just saw this question in chat and I really like the question from Dwayne Allen. I like it too. He says, what is the most ghetto way, tool, or method you ever used to fix a car? I feel like that's a super good question. I don't have an answer on the top of my head. Now, I mean, tool. I, tool. Let's do tool. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to start off with tool because... I've made some some weird, odd tools. I've taken, <clears throat> for the 2019 Rams, to be able to do the rear shocks, or maybe it's even a little earlier than those, the 2500s and like the 17 and ups, the rear shocks on those go into the middle of the frame, and you cannot get to that upper nut to be able to take those freaking shocks off Mm -hmm. and it takes a 22 millimeter but it's like up over the channel and down in so i took a 22 millimeter wrench from autozone heated it up and it's on like 130 degree 140 degree angle i've used that wrench (laughs) yep exactly and you're like wow how do i never have this wrench this is amazing (laughs) that's a pretty good one Mm-hmm. See, I can't. I feel like I'm just not as experienced as you. I can't think of any ghetto tools, or the only thing I can think of is like strip bolts. I don't think it's that ghetto. I think it's kind of common, but maybe not. You take a little die grinder and you just make it a flathead just to get it out of there. I think it's common. I don't know. I always kind of feel ghetto reaching down in like an engine bay or suspension and just grinding out a little channel to put a flathead. <laughs> it feels a little ghetto. 
I am pretty, ex- speaking of grain, and I'm pretty excited. I just got my hands on the new, the straight uh, grinder oh, okay. from Milwaukee. Just came in the mail uh, yesterday. So I'll have a chance this week to put it through its paces and That'd see how cool. I, I, I'm excited to use that one for exhaust bolts. Yeah, You know how in, in our shop, for those of you who do not live in the Rust Belt, whenever I see a vehicle that is any older than one to two years <laughs> old, the exhaust bolts are not going to come out. It, sure. it just will not happen. Not going to happen ever. You will cut them off. So at any po- any more at that point, I don't even try to take them out anymore. I just look at them like, <laughs> yep, that's not happening. Yeah. Cut them. You about have to anymore. Yeah, I've seen it. Um, David down here said used zip ties to drive shaft onto the rear. Just when I put did that new uh, tranny in my Lancer, I didn't have the shift cable clips to hold the shift cables in. And so, I mean, until the clips got there from Mitsubishi, I used four zip ties to hold those cables in. And it worked. It worked mm. just fine. Nathan K also... He has the special tool that I also had made. I took a pocket screwdriver and about an inch and a half up from the tip, bent it over at 90 degrees, and that's how you get airbags out of um, caravans, Wranglers, uh, the Dodge trucks that we've had to do all the wiring fixes for recalls. That's the tool that I use for that. Brian down there just said blood pressure cuff for a lockout tool. Genius. (laughs) <laughs> I love there you that. go there you go it's pretty Let's smart see. i know I mean, i've done a lot of other crazy sh- stupid yeah, stuff i can't tell you any particular time but i use the metal clothes hangers like all the time i don't know exactly for what but i always use them mm-hmm. you can just bend them into whatever you want Oh, I remember a, a ghetto thing. Okay, I remember one now. So this was back when I was still training, and Ralph, my mentor at the time, um, we had a newer truck that was up on the rack, and we had taken it apart for an issue with the brakes. Brakes in the front, uh, they were squealing. They had a bunch of issues. Uh, we said okay they're ordered from chrysler they'll be here the next day uh get in the next morning ends up they're not there all right there'll be another day wait another day come in still not there all right screw this put the old brakes put it back together we're gonna put it outside somebody misplaced the brakes there's no brakes anywhere so somebody had thrown them away and at that time we had somebody take our trash out at night for us no brakes there. So what did we do? Took a two by four and we fashioned ourselves a set of brake pads that fit into the channels just to be able to get this truck outside. What? Yep. <laughs> yep. That's a good one. Yep. Found it out put up this piece of wood right up to the bracket and Mm -hmm. traced around the two channels to be able to fit it in there and just cut it out. He had a little hand saw, cut it out, fit it into the channels. And it was two pieces of two by four for brake pads just to get it outside to move it around in the lot. We had to wait like two and a half more weeks for that set of brake pads, but it worked great. Did they squeak? (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> they didn't stop for a damn, but <laughs> that's beside the point. Okay, now for one of those idiot YouTube channels out there, they need to do the what if brake pads were made of wood? <laughs> I want to see somebody. How take long all the brake will pads they last? Off, put them all on wood and just go cruise and see what happens. Or do a, te- a challenge test making brake pads out of a whole bunch of different materials mm-hmm. on what would work and what would last. What would work. I really like, I'm, I'm having a fun time range chat right now. Yeah. The ghetto sledgehammer made of just lifting free weights. I've seen that one. Together. Dick, I saw that one and I have used one of those hammers before. Not fun. Do not recommend it. They are the 
worst hammer idea Have ever. Have you used one of those hammers before? Yes. Yep, I had one that uh, my uncle had made, and he used it for pounding in these big stakes. Uh, he put up those big, like, circus tents for okay, a company, yeah. so they have big stakes. So he made one of these big hammers out of old sledgehammer. It's all one piece of steel. One piece of steel is not smart. It rings, and it oh, vibrates your hand so bad. So he's like, yeah, just take that one to work and use that. It'll You'll get anything off. I hit a rotor with that two times, threw that thing across the shop. Nope, never using that thing again. That that's was the insane. stupidest thing I've ever tried to use. <laughs> yeah, that's so insane. But mm -hmm. Whatever works, even though yeah. it didn't sound like it worked very well. Did it no. get the rotor off? It, it did get the rotor off, but my hand was hurting. For about 10 15 minutes it so was it still worked yeah it was it was hurting quite a bunch for that one i wish i was there could have given <laughs> you the old use your strong hand <laughs> use your strong hand <laughs> oh man all right well guys it has been a real one we are just over our one hour time allotment on the stream for tonight uh everybody if you have not already make sure you make your way over to mick bake's channel he has his own youtube channel i will put it into chat here for you guys uh subscribe to that one he's got some really good stuff coming out here for you in the next couple of weeks right yes right i do i'm getting back on it like i said it's been a couple quiet weeks but we're getting back into it yep yep we're gonna get back into a lot of cool fun stuff uh this next week coming up over on my channel uh first of the week we're gonna have a video on some upgrades the very first set of upgrades for the k &M. we're installing a backup camera and some sport mirrors to that one First electrical stuff, pretty exciting. Awesome. And then uh, later on in the week, I will have a, another Nifty Tools video for you guys. I know everyone's been clamoring for one of those, and I've got some really cool new stuff that I've been uh, checking out over the last week or two in the shop. Uh, that new bolt uh, divider that I showed you this last week mm -hmm. i'll be putting some pictures of that one on instagram too prior to the video that one has turned out pretty amazing i loved how that one's turned out yes. but yeah we're going to be using uh, showing you guys some more tools nifty things coming on for that one and then coming up into this next weekend pile of more bigger better can-am parts that we'll be installing on there as well uh, SP Tools get their butts to Canada. Yeah. Yeah, SP Tools does not, unfortunately, have a big presence in Canada. Uh, I believe they will sell to people in Canada. You're just paying for the shipping would be my guess for that one. That sucks. But, yeah, unfortunately. Well, that's about all I've got for you today. Anything else for you there, Mike? Yeah, I just want to tell everybody that when you're out there driving, stay to the right, except to pass. Words from the master right there. Yep. <laughs> Sounds like he had some frustrating moments driving ben today. <laughs> yeah. There you go. All right, guys. Well, appreciate everyone tuning in tonight. Make sure you uh, hit that subscribe button and throw up that thumbs up button on your way out of the stream, too. Always like to see that one. Every time we come through here next week, the Tech Talk Live will be on Captain Ron's channel. So make sure you tune into that one over at the Master Apprentice. Uh, go and subscribe to that one as well. Appreciate it, you guys. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, you guys stay awesome.